एस डी ऑन नॉलेज फाउंडेशन आई एम प्राची चांदेकर योर एंकर फॉर दिस सेशन दिस सेशन इज ऑफ फोर्टी मिनिट्स एंड अ बेल विल बी रैंक एट द एंड ऑफ फोर्टी मिनिट्स द टॉपिक ऑफ द सेशन इज नाइट ऑफ द रेस्टलेस स्पिरिट्स आई एम वेरी प्लेजेंट टू वेलकम द स्पीकर ऑफ द सेशन सरप्रीत सिंह सर इज अ राइटर पॉडकास्टर and commentator sir is also the author of the best selling the camel merchant of philadelphia and the writer narrator of the story of the six podcast which has listeners in over 90 countries we welcome you sir for the session now i shall introduce the moderator of the session anushree kaushal ma'am Ma'am is an editor. She was previously worked at Penguin Random House, India, for over five years, commissioning a range of fiction and non-fiction. Working closely with Arundhati Roy, Devdutt Patnaik, and Manju Kapoor, among others, she specializes in politics, international relations, and literary. and general fiction we welcome you ma'am for the session and the session is over to you ma'am anushree kaushal ma'am thanks a lot prachi uh, hi everyone welcome to the orange city literature festival i am here today with sarpreet singh um sarpreet uh, like prachi just mentioned is the author of uh, night of the restless spirits which is his debut short story collection sarpreet uh, can you hear me yes i can All right, um, Sarpreet. Just to begin uh, by talking about the book just a little bit. Um, so I, I have been involved with the book for a very long time now, and in its most pared down form, *Night of the Restless Spirits* is a collection of short stories, all revolving around the events of 1984, which by themselves were fraught with violence and anger and betrayal and tragedy and political machination, but. Sarpreet, what you have done through the book is so much more than that. 1984, as we know it now, would arguably not be as evocative if it weren't for how the people who lived through it have remembered and told it. And Sarpreet, to begin with, I want to know from you your own experience of and relationship with the events of the time, and how that lent itself to the genesis of the book and the way you've chosen to approach the stories in it. Uh, sure, Anushree. I'll be very happy to talk about that. Um, my direct connection with the events was actually quite tenuous. Mm-hmm. I was an engineering student at that time, and I was in Pilani, a few hours away from Delhi, where we had some minor disturbances, but really nothing very significant happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, as a young Sikh who had never lived in Punjab. and you know i grew up in sikkim i attended engineering school in rajasthan and then for a couple of years i worked in mumbai before moving to the us uh, uh i didn't have a strong personal connection to the events nor was i impacted by them uh, furthermore uh in a time several years before the internet when the only sources of news that we were had access to were quote unquote official you know all india radio doordarshan yeah. and um a press which uh, generally tended to toe um the line of the powers that be very very carefully and consistently i actually had a somewhat a poor sense of what had transpired so the general narrative was um, uh you know the six were agitating for certain rights in punjab their movement turned violent there was a lot of terrorism uh, the government very justifiably attacked the golden temple in order to resolve that situation and then mrs gandhi was killed in retaliation and there was a spontaneous outpouring of anger in which a few six were targeted mm-hmm. so that was my understanding of the events uh you know as a young man from a uh, 
upper middle class family educated in quote unquote public schools. My concerns were very different and none of this affected me very, very significantly. Yeah. Fast forward a few years, I'm now in the US and I start getting access to alternate accounts of what had happened, notably those written by human rights activists, uh, uh, which to me seemed to be unimpeachable sources. And that's really when I had my epiphany. I, um, you know, I found that what these groups wrote as having happened in 1984 was mm -hmm. diametrically opposite from the narrative that I had been exposed to. And really, it was the turmoil that learning about what had actually happened in 1984, that's what informed my early writing. So this collection uh, really came into being over a 30-year period. Uh, right. Some of the pieces were written in the early 90s when I was a young man, after I'd had my epiphany, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, most notably, the title story, uh, Night of yeah. the Restless Spirits, and also the last piece in the book, the long story in verse, Gultar's Mind, were written several years ago. Uh, the, some of the other stories were written quite recently, over the past three or four years, mm -hmm. after, through a set of circumstances, I went back to revisiting 1984, and really felt that the events needed to be examined with nuance from many, many different angles. So that's how this came about. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that uh, I'm very grateful to uh, you know, organizations like Citizens for Democracy, the PUCL, the PUDR, journalists like Madhu Kishvar, anthropologists mm -hmm. like Dr. Veena Das, who yeah. painstakingly documented Umar Chakravarti, Dr. Umar Chakravarti, I have to mention her, mm -hmm. all of these individuals and organizations very diligently and painstakingly documented what had actually happened and thus managed to preserve a very dark chapter of our history. And that's what informs this collection of short fiction. Right. And I'm going to come, up, come back to a bunch of things that you've said there, but um, to everyone who is watching, um, Sarpreet has written a very uh, thorough kind of article talking about some of the resources that he kind of accessed himself. And that article is on the Penguin India website right now. Uh, so if you go to the Penguin India, India website and type in Night of the Restless Spirits, the article is going to come up. Um, but Sarpreet, coming back uh, to our chat right now. Uh, as an editor, I am always, of course, intrigued by the book as a form of as, as a piece of literature, to put it kind of crudely, and and um, in this in this collection specifically, I'm I'm also very intrigued by some of the decisions you make when you're writing. So you choose very specific points of views in the stories, and the one that has always kind of sat really significantly with me was the general, um, because it not only tells you the actual story but also the anguish of those who don't necessarily have anything directly to do with the events. They are for all intents and purposes, peripheral characters to the central events of 1984. But you've chosen the perspective of someone who was not directly involved, who was whose family member was involved. And how do you choose to write that perspective? And what is your what is your thought process behind it? So that's that's a wonderful question, Anushri, and it's going to make me think. Uh, so uh, uh, I I would say that um, writing with that distance probably comes out of my own experience because, you know, I wasn't personally affected by these events either. So um, that gives me the benefit of being able to look at the events from outside, so to speak. I'm yeah. sure if I had been, you know, one of those poor souls who was set upon in Delhi during the violence, my perspective might have been a little different. So yeah. I think that's a significant part. Uh, the other part, which sort of goes hand in hand, and you didn't ask the question this way, but let me volunteer this anyway. It's important to understand that the trauma of 1984 was not experienced by only those who experienced them, who you know were exposed to the violence firsthand. Of course, their pain was the most intense and the most immediate. Yeah. 
But this is really the trauma of an entire community, which has gone addressed for unaddressed for 36 years. Why? Because those that were complicit have continued, had continued to rule for decades. There was no reckoning. There doesn't seem to be a reckoning in sight. And furthermore, there have been systematic efforts to erase the events from collective memory. I mean, case in point, this is not something that you find in history books, nor are you ever likely to. So I think that the distance that I got from not having been directly involved perhaps informed my choice of some of the characters and their perspectives. I have to tell you, though, that uh, it's difficult to separate your characters from yourself. So, you know, even though the stories are very diverse, they cover, you know, very broad ground, Mm -hmm. inevitably my personal perspective creeps into that of one character or another. Right. And, yeah, I mean, anyone who kind of reads the book is also very aware of the very wide range of perspectives that you are able to take. And like you said, of course, it's very difficult to remove yourself from the characters that you're creating. But still, you know, like in each story, the voices are very, very original too. And I think one of the stories that kind of, um, you know, it jumps out a lot more strongly is is um, the Night of the Restless Spirits itself, you know, the, the titular story. And Satri, there you've also used something which you're trained in yourself. You're a classical musician. And uh, that is that aspect is kind of reflected in the story too. And it, the story in itself is one of the more lyrical pieces in the book, especially on a, on a syntax level as well. But it is also structured in a unique way in that it kind of amalgamates the horrors of 1984 and those of Jallianwala Bagh and back in 1919, positioning them kind of side by side and using memory and history as tools to signify that something can live forever and in some shape or form can be repeated. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that story and your and your specific process behind writing that? Okay, there's a lot to unpack in there. So let me take a Sorry. crack at it. Yes. <laughs> That's a wonderful I question. Like I, yeah, I involved a lot of, because it's, it's, it's one of those stories that has always kind of jumped out for me personally. And a lot of people who have spoken to me about that about the book also talk about that story very specifically. It's so, my yeah, favorite so as well. Yeah. It's my favorite as well. Uh, you know, uh, for an author to pick one out of a collection is like asking a parent to pick a favorite child. Yes. But unequivocally, you know, this is one of the shortest stories in the book, but the mm-hmm. canvas is one of the largest. So yeah. let me start with a small correction. Mm-hmm. I would consider myself to be an avid listener of <laughs> classical music and a dabbler rather mm-hmm. than a musician. I think the title right. of musician is a little loftier than one that I deserve. Fair enough, uh, fair enough. Uh, but, but, you know, all, all joking aside, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, when I wrote this book, um, I was in a certain sense trying to find my roots, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. You know, which is quite common in all exiles. At some point in your life, you start gravitating back towards your culture. Uh, Now, I was this Western-educated young man who used to find all forms of Indian music rather annoying. And, (laughs) you know, I uh, I used to consume exclusively a diet of rock music, and then I sort of gravitated to the jazz and the blues. So it was quite the departure for me. And really, my search for my roots led me to Gurmit Sangeet, or Sikh sacred music, and Indian classical music. So as a young man in Milwaukee, you know, at that time when I, when I wrote this, uh, I started immersing myself in music, listening, and naya uh, shokta uh, in a certain sense. And, you know, yeah. I was really enamored of the music, and that mm-hmm. clearly comes through in the story. Yes. Uh, The other thing that had happened at that time was, uh, as somebody who grew up in Sikkim had never been taught Sikh history, quote unquote, because, you know, in my uh, ICSE textbooks, uh, Sikh history was not even a footnote. Mm -hmm. So there was very little that I knew about Sikh history other than the few things that Everybody in the subcontinent knows about Guru Nanak and Guru Gobind Singh. That was pretty much it. Uh, 
So I had just stumbled upon uh, some history books, most notably History of the Six by J.D. Cunningham. And then I had gone on to seek out other books. And I had just engaged with the sweep of Sikh history, which I found to be very inspiring and very exhilarating. And then as I engaged further, I started learning more about the broader history of the Punjab. And that makes its way abundantly into this particular story. Because, uh, you know, Punjab, uh, perhaps by virtue of its unique geographic position, has been uh, subjected to invasions for millennia. And yeah. really, the violence, the cycle of violence has continued. The perpetrators have been different. The people have been the same throughout millennia, no matter you know, what their names have been and what their fates have been. So that was something that was tremendously important to me as I was creating the story. Uh, another element was uh, some of my literary influences at that time. You know, I had... Uh, a few years earlier, I had read three books that I had tremendously enjoyed. And it's interesting that decades later, when my beard is gray, these three books still feature on the list of maybe the top five books I've read in my life. And these are 100 Years of Solitude, Gabriel Garcia yeah. Perez, The Tin Drum by Gunter Grass, and Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. So, uh, you know, these are all in the magic realism genre. So, you know, that influence can clearly be seen in the story. And some of the language, uh, you know, I would say, I will freely admit that, you know, I was somewhat inspired by Salman Rushdie and also G.V. Dasani, you know, all about H. Mm -hmm. Hatter, which was one okay. of the books to be written in a very specific writing style. So mm -hmm. it's interesting that, you know, all of these streams of influences, you know, my through my search uh, for music, uh, history, and then the influence of these three writers, all of them sort of seeped into this tiny little story, which mm -hmm. to me is very much the heart of this collection. Yes. And we were talking about, um, I, I also had a section about, you know, it's it uses the tools of kind of memory and history as something that kind of repeats itself and you've mm -hmm. used that pretty pretty well pretty beautifully and like in a, in a very seamless way again speaking as an editor and as an avid reader and um yeah and, and i mean you've already mentioned some of your favorite authors and i was really kind of intrigued by one of the questions that i always ask some of my favorite authors is that what are what are some of the things that you were reading uh, while you were writing these stories. And I mean, I, of course, you were reading a lot for research too, but what are the, what is the kind of fiction that kind of informs these specific uh, specific stories? And of course, you've written them over a longer period of time. So, yes, you know, yes. it's a longish answer, but I would still Indeed. like to know very much. Uh, sure. So I've talked about what I was reading when I was writing the early stories. And for yeah. the benefit of readers, the early stories are the title story, Kultar's Mime, and notably the survivor, you know, which mm -hmm. is written about the train massacre. Yes. Uh, the others were written much, much later. And, yeah. uh, you know, I do read a lot of uh, nonfiction as well, but I am essentially a fiction nerd. I mean, that's what I really, yeah. really enjoy reading. And I would say that when the latter stories were written, uh, you know, I can definitely point to some of the writers that I had read uh, who may or may not have influenced these stories. It's kind of hard for me to draw a direct line. But mm -hmm. among uh, some of the contemporary authors that I enjoy reading, I would say that uh, uh, I absolutely love the work of Zadie Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, White Teeth is one of the best novels that I think I've read. And uh, I'm I'm waiting for her to write the next White Thief, so to speak. And, you know, she's a young, young writer, so hopefully there's a lot more to come. Yeah. I love the work of Jonathan Franzen. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love the work of Hilary Mantel. Right. And then those books are uh, just, you know, <laughs> mind-bogglingly amazing. 
And then one of the pieces of fiction that uh, really spoke to me that I read, uh, you know, over the past few years uh, was uh, Peter Matheson's Shadow Country. So Peter Matheson is more known uh, perhaps as a writer of nonfiction, uh, but uh, this piece of historical fiction uh, you know, which talks about the founding of Florida using a real life character and sort of fleshing it out as fiction, um, I found just brilliant. And, you know, Hilary Mantel also, you know, uh, you know, it's fiction, but it's rooted in real characters. Absolutely. So that's something that inspires me tremendously. And, uh, you know, I will freely admit that in the latter stories, you know, the latter stories are all fiction as well. Mm -hmm. But in some instances, there is a germ of reality. You know, in uh, Baji, for instance, the opening story of the book, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I actually did read about, uh, uh, you know, a man who was then a young student in Delhi who was very attached to one of his sick friends and tried to help her. Now, you know, his circumstances were very different. What happens in the story is fictionalized, but really taking that germ of reality and then sort of creating something around it. I, I think to, uh, you know, if I look at Hilary Mantel's work and if I look at Peter Matheson's work, you know, I would say that they are definitely role models for me in a certain sense. And yeah. uh, uh, I know for a fact that uh, their writing has informed some of my work, which is forthcoming. You know, there's a novel that I've completed recently, which is in similar mm -hmm. vein. Uh, yeah. It really takes the story of fictional characters, uh, real life characters, and sort of fleshes them out of, as fiction. Right. And um, your previous book, The Camel Merchant of Philadelphia, was nonfiction. Mm -hmm. yes. And uh, this is, of course, collection of fictional stories and inspired by real life events, but at the end of their fiction. And your next book is nonfiction as well. Yes. And I was, I wanted to know what, what is your preferred form of writing and how is writing nonfiction different <laughs> from fiction? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I really enjoy writing nonfiction as well. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, particularly seeking out stories or seeking out well-known stories and approaching them from a different perspective. You know, that was mm -hmm. The Camel Merchant of Philadelphia. Uh, Ranjit Singh has been written about extensively. You know, there are multiple books about Ranjit Singh. Some of them are quite excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, Krishwant Singh's uh, book, I think, is a standout, and there are several others. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote The Camel Merchant of Philadelphia, my focus was on Ranjit Singh and yet not uses real events as the backdrop. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I'm writing a particular story, you know, for instance, when I was writing The Curfew, which is mm -hmm. about, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the mutiny that happened in Ramgarh, and this battalion of Sikh soldiers who set out to Punjab to do they don't know what, as a response to the attack on the Golden Temple. Yeah. So it was kind of, you know, this might sound really nerdy, but it was important for me to know what villages exactly fall on the way as they drive from Ramgarh to Amritsar so that when they have to stop at a Dhaba to eat, you know, yeah. it kind of makes sense given how many hours that uh, they've been driving. So I'm probably telling you more than you want to know, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being tongue in cheek. Uh, uh, but, you know, that's kind of how I tend to approach my fiction as well. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure if I were ever to write something that was set in a fantasy world, it would be very, very different. But when I'm writing about things that happen or happened in the real world, mm -hmm. I like to be grounded by mundane things, you know? Yeah. Uh, what's in the town, you know, mm -hmm. what are they likely to encounter? What were mm -hmm. they likely to see? You know, if I'm writing about a place that I haven't been to, as I am right now, you know, I wouldn't be above going to Google Earth and zooming <laughs> yeah. in on a particular mohalla in a town to kind of yeah. get a sense of what might I see if I were walking around. I mean, don't you love the world that we're in now with all the technology uh, you know, writers have so many more tools at their disposal. 
Absolutely. So, yeah. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's kind of how I tend to write. No, it absolutely does answer. And of course, this is the level of this is the kind of diligence that obviously adds to the story as well. Like, you know, that you can trust the author in, in the information that he's providing to you as a reader. Um, but separate also, you know, the short stories in the book are, of course, there, but like a piece of writing, which is very, very different from these short stories is, of course, Kuntar Smile, which appears towards the end of the book and is a play written in verse. And uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the genesis of Kultar's mime and, and its journey, uh, you know, to the book? Because I believe it, it, it came into existence a long time ago. Uh, it did. And uh, again, I will talk about influences as well and, you know, a very unlikely influence. So right around that time, I had read uh, Vikram Seth's The Golden Gate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was, uh, uh, I think, uh, the last time somebody had attempted a novel in verse was Pushkin, Mm -hmm. uh, Eugene Onegin, which was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So I was so charmed by The Golden Gate. I enjoyed reading. I'm a huge fan of Vikram Seth's writing as well. I enjoyed that book very much, and uh, it's kind of odd almost in hindsight, you know, that book is, you know, written in such a light manner, it's such a pleasant read, that the notion that something from that book would have crept into something as dark as Kultar's mime, Mm -hmm. you know, almost seems odd in hindsight. But from a writer's perspective, you know, I just felt that he had told the story very beautifully. And that was kind of in the back of my mind. Uh, Kultar's mime, I have to say, more or less wrote itself. And what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, this was written right around that time when I was engaging with the material that I talked about. You know, I was angry and indignant upon reading, you know, this booklet prepared by the POCL PUDR and Madhukeshwar's article both of which talked about the fact that what had happened in Delhi was no riot, you know, which in a triumph of semantics has persisted even till today. The most well-intentioned people refer to the events of Delhi as the Delhi riots. And it really, it really, really makes me very upset. But, you know, that's the brilliant brilliance of newspeak, you know, it's Mm -hmm. persisted. So, I had read these things. They had created a tremendous amount of turmoil in my heart. And then I happened upon Dr. Das's paper. So Dr. Veena Das had been an anthropologist in Delhi, and she had followed some of the children who had survived the massacre. And she wrote about how they dealt with their PTSD in their play. One of the uh, cases that she talked about was this young boy named Avtar, who was deaf and mute. Mm -hmm. who, having no other way to articulate his trauma, would mime out his father's lynching by a mob before his eyes. Mm -hmm. There was another child that she wrote about. Her name was Baloo, and her father was doused in gasoline or kerosene and set on fire. And this little girl would not let her father's hand go until he had a breath left in his body, The mob, out of shame, tried to pull her away, but she held on with superhuman strength and her own hand was burned. So when I read about these two children in particular, and, you know, in the backdrop was my newly acquired knowledge of what had actually happened and the massacre and the terrible things that had happened, sort of Kultar's mime just poured out almost of its own accord. I mean, I Mm -hmm. literally don't remember sitting and thinking about it. It was just a very visceral kind of response. Mm -hmm. So that's how it came about. And, you know, this was, um, I would say, probably right around 1990, you know, after I had just started engaging with this material. Mm -hmm. And it is one of the most extraordinary pieces of writing that you know, we, as you know, we we worked on the book together, and we kind of really, really wanted to include that in the book as well. Mm-hmm. Even though it had a life of its own previously, 
Indeed. as as a play that you you with your daughter kind of uh, performed at you know numerous stage uh, on numerous stages across continents and mm-hmm. i'm glad it lived the life that it did and i'm also glad that it it's going to be like people are going to be able to access it through the book as well and so please one of the the since we're you know we're just about to we have to end the one of the last questions i want to ask you is um you know the timing of the publication of the book it's significant that the material in the book is still resonating with readers in a way you know in in a in a political way in a in a social way and it also kind of you know talks about what is happening in the world right now the kind of shift that the world is seeing in terms of identity politics and the fact that it's come out now is also really really significant too um and i really want to understand your you know i want to know your thoughts about how the book is significant in in today's kind of time and where we live in absolutely i mean you're you're touching upon a subject that is very close to my heart and let me elaborate so the stories in this book the story of 1984 is not a sick story mm-hmm. you know it's a much much broader story you know in in the broadest sense it's a human story and certainly narrowing it down it's very much an indian story and what do i mean by that <laughs> these instances of sectarian violence are not isolated you know 1984 was not the first 1984 and it's not going to be unfortunately the last 1984 either mm-hmm. you know 1984 was followed by godra you know there was a 1984 in the making at the start of this year you know when the shaheen bagh protests were going on and the other student protests were going on in delhi where the protesters were set upon with tremendous violence so really as far as i'm concerned fiction like this is tremendously important because it acts as a cautionary tale you know because this kind of violence is perpetrated by those that are powerful it's never going to find its way into history books i mean can you imagine you know 1984 or godra appearing in a indian history textbook you know for yeah. high school students anytime soon no absolutely not and that's the work that's the task that these kinds of pieces of fiction can accomplish really acting as a cautionary tale and sensitizing us to the dangers of sectarian violence and what can be and, and you know despite the fact that i've written about very dark things i refuse to be a cynic i yeah. have to believe that as long as we keep talking about these things as long as we embrace each other's pain it doesn't matter to me who the perpetrators are this is all about the victims and the pain of the victims is exactly the same no matter which instance of sectarian violence you're talking about that to me is the relevance of this work and other works of its kind yeah you you put it so beautifully yourself and i completely agree works of fiction can you know be better teachers than works of non fiction can be and they teach you of course you learn so many facts through this book as well but works of fiction also teach you empathy and they teach you how to be human and i think night of the restless spirits is you know a perfect example of a book like that so uh thank you so much sarpreet for for writing it and um i feel like we are out of time but if i could just ask you one last question Please. for people who are um writing their own books and writing fiction and non fiction do you have something that you kind of abide by do you have any um inspirational words for them do you have any advice for them that you want to impart before we leave uh i i would say that uh, for somebody who's trying to break into the world of writing and getting published it can be a very daunting and intimidating task yeah. i i would say that you just have to have confidence in yourself and you have to trust the people around you and your network i mean you know if you're willing to persist and if mm-hmm. you're just willing 
you know, if you never stop disbelieving, uh, if you never stop believing in yourself, I would say that my single piece of advice to upcoming writers is keep at it. You know, if you're yeah. writing something of value, you will absolutely find an audience. And maybe if you're lucky, you also find a fabulous editor like I was fortunate to find. So thank you for your contributions to this book and making it happen. Now, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to work on this book and bring it out in the world. And I'm so happy that it's out there and people are getting to read it. Um, and thank you so much, Sabri, for being here today and sharing your words with the art viewers today. And uh, Prachi, over to you. Thank, Thank you so much for this wonderful session, sir. It was pleasure having you today for the topic, Night of the Restless Spirits. I would also like to give thanks to our moderator, Anushri Kaushal, ma'am. Thanks, ma'am, for moderating the session. It was pleasure listening you both for the topic. On behalf of Orange City Literature Fest, we express we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. Thank you so much, ma'am. So here we come to an end for the three-day event of the Orange City Literature Fest 2020. After hearing our speakers and gaining knowledge from their sessions, let's refresh ourselves and join for a musical event by Mame Khan. Thank you and have a fun-filled evening ahead. And not to be forgetting to lock the dates of Orange City Literature Fest Season 3, 26, 27, 28 November 2021. So see you all next year. Till then, stay happy and stay safe. Twenty years of existence. Two universities. Twenty-three educational institutes. Offering 137 courses. Rai Sony Group of Institutions. A vision beyond.